Hi, this is Mike Elliott, and you're watching an SEC Filings TV industry focus featuring regenerative medicine. On October 14th, the world's leading regenerative medicine companies convened in La Jolla, California for the 2013 Stem Cell Meeting on the Mesa. Sponsored by the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, the conference regularly attracts regenerative medicine companies, big pharma, disease philanthropies, investors, and major research institutions, as well as leading scientists and researchers in the field. These attendees had the opportunity to present, attend panels, and hold one-on-one -on -one meetings to find partners and investors. Athersis was among the companies presenting at this year's conference as one of the leading players in the industry. Its flagship allogenic stem cell platform, called MultiStem, has broad applications for treating conditions including inflammatory bowel disease, graft-versus-host disease, acute myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, and many other diseases and conditions and with the potential to be mass produced and used off the shelf without tissue matching, the platform could prove revolutionary in the regenerative medicine space. The following is the company's full presentation that was given on Tuesday, October 15th. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, over the next few minutes, I'm gonna provide a brief update and an overview of some of the key regenerative medicine programs at, at uh, Athersis. I will be making some forward-looking statements that are covered under Safe, Harvard, uh, under Safe Harbor as we are a public company listed on NASDAQ. So Athersis has been a public company since 2007, and for more than a decade, um, we have been focused on the area of regenerative medicine. We have some other programs which I'm not gonna talk about today, but our primary focus in the area of regenerative medicine is on the development of multi-stem, which we're developing as an off-the-shelf therapy for a variety of different indication areas. This product actually dis exhibits a very distinctive profile with regard to scalability, ease of use, and therapeutic effects. So what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is provide an overview and an update on a couple of key areas. I'm not going to have an opportunity to go into detail on each one of our programs, um, nor will I be discussing our non-regenerative medicine programs, but I refer you to our website, and of course I'd be happy to talk to people um, offline. So th this slide provides a, a visual summary of some of the key elements of our regenerative medicine portfolio, which has been predominantly focused on the inflammatory and immune, cardiovascular, and neurological areas. We currently have five clinical stage programs, four of which are at mid to later stage clinical development. These include our ongoing phase two clinical trial, uh, which is partnered with Pfizer to treat patients that are suffering from treatment refractory inflammatory bowel disease. This trial is rapidly approaching completion of enrollment. Uh, we actually uh, anticipate that the enrollment will be completed here uh, in the near term, and we expect that uh, data will actually be reported out from this study sometime early next year. In addition to that, we have an ongoing international phase two clinical trial to treat patients that have suffered an ischemic stroke, which we think is a huge area of unmet medical need, and I'll be talking about that a little bit um, uh, later in the presentation. Uh, we are uh, actively planning for commencement of a phase two, three clinical trial to treat patients that are at high risk for incurring graft-versus-host disease. Um, we're taking a slightly different approach there as opposed to waiting for the graft-versus-host disease to actually occur in these patients. We're trying to prevent it by treating them prophylactically with multi-stem around the time of engraftment, and I'll touch a little bit on some of the exciting data that we've generated from that program. We also recently were awarded a phase two grant supporting uh, or a grant to support our phase two clinical trial in the cardiovascular area to treat patients that have suffered damage from myocardial infarction. I'm not gonna talk about that program today, but again, I'm happy to discuss it offline or refer, to, uh, refer you to our website for additional information. And finally, we have a phase one um, investigator-sponsored trial that is ongoing in Germany right now in the area of solid organ transplant. We recently published some data in the area that shows that we can use multi-stem as a way to condition uh, the immune system actually during the engraftment process to endure, induce long-term, very durable tolerance to allografts. Uh, and we, that's something that we think actually opens up a whole host of opportunities in the transplant area that we're excited about. So what is multi-stem? Well, multi-stem essentially is a special class of stem cells. These are very early progenitor cells that can be isolated from bone marrow as well as a range of other tissue and organ systems. In fact, RIP is uh, very broad in scope that covers not only the, the purified composition of, of cells that we work with, but also is, um, is broadly covering uh, the isolation of these cells irrespective of source of origin. These cells have very robust growth properties, and in fact, we and our collaborators have demonstrated that once we isolate these cells from young, healthy, consenting donors, because of their robust and distinctive growth properties, we can actually grow them up in enormous quantities. In fact, we can produce millions of clinical doses with material that we generate from each individual healthy, consenting donor. We're developing the product as a true off-the-shelf product that will be thawed and administered directly to the patient. 
And as you can see here, um, we actually have a number of product configurations that we're developing, including uh, IV bag or vial type formats, as well as in a device format, which will be useful for some of the cardiovascular indications. We've already completed extensive stability studies on the product. We've completed five-year stability studies showing that our cryopreserved product is, uh, has a very long shelf life. We've demonstrated through multiple clinical programs and extensive preclinical work that the product has a very consistent safety profile. It does not require tissue matching or immunosuppression as we administer the product. And importantly, the, cell is, the, the product that we're administering is not a permanent transplant. It actually has a drug-like characteristic or a profile, if you will, in, in terms of administering the product. It's typically around for days to weeks in the patient. The cells actually show the capacity to home to sites of tissue damage, inflammation, and injury. And when they get there, they can actually regulate the healing process through a variety of different mechanisms. And we've published extensively on this. And so, again, I refer you to the website. I'm not going to have a chance to get into the molecular details today. But basically, over the past decade, I think more and more people have begun to appreciate that cells, as dynamic living entities, have the capacity to respond to an environment in which they're placed where there is tissue damage or ischemic injury or a disease process ongoing. And one of the ways they do this is through direct cell-cell interaction or through the production of various factors that can restore a durable balance to the immune system, uh, can reduce active inflammatory processes which create a lot of tissue damage in a range of different indication areas. We also know that our cells express neuroprotective factors or cytoprotective factors so they can actually protect at-risk tissue in a variety of different indication areas that might be lost uh, due to ischemic stress or other types of um, hostile environments, if you will. And these cells also express a range of different angiogenic and vasculogenic factors, and we've actually completed and published head-to-head -head studies that show that our cells express a broader range of factors than other cell types that we've looked at, as well as have greater immunomodulatory properties. So again, this really isn't about cell replacement or tissue replacement, at least not in the direct sense. These cells are inducing healing and tissue repair through a variety of different mechanisms that we've shown that they act through. So think of them as essentially as living drugs. Now, one of the things that was mentioned yesterday and was also mentioned again early this morning is the exciting impact of the evolving regulatory environment that's going on, not only here in the United States, but also internationally as well. I believe there are real opportunities for the community of companies in the regenerative medicine uh, area to take advantage of some of these opportunities, whether it's uh, in relation to the broad and accelerated approval framework that's going into effect, uh, the breakthrough therapies paradigm, which was discussed this morning, with the appropriate caveats that some of the people, people mentioned, but also some of the international regulatory uh, advancements that were mentioned yesterday. Um, so, for example, in Japan, where they're creating a, what I refer to as a hyper-accelerated pathway for specifically designed for regenerative medicine therapies. And I was recently over in Japan meeting with the leadership from PMDA and MHLW, along with some of the other members of our team. And I can tell you they're very excited about the potential implementation of this framework, and they see it actually creating a lot of benefits um, clinically and then over time in their national healthcare system. So that's something to take note of. One of the programs that I'm very excited about is our our several-year partnership with Pfizer, which is focused on treating uh, patients that have treatment refractory inflammatory bowel disease. Now, many people, when they focus on IBD, they tend to head for Crohn's first because it's a more serious disease indication, as, as Donna was talking about earlier today. We and Pfizer actually thought it would be more appropriate to um, do an initial clinical evaluation in ulcerative colitis for a couple of reasons, but one very simple reason being that we can actually endoscopically evaluate the patients. We can look at the lesions and see whether or not the lesions are getting better, whether or not we're reducing the number of lesions, the intensity, and the size of the, of the lesions, and can we quantitatively assess, or we can use that to quantitatively assess whether or not uh, the patients are, in fact, healing or responding to the therapy. So we've made good, steady progress over this. We announced this partnership at the end of 2009. Uh, within a year, we had gotten regulatory sign-off to move the program directly into a Phase two trial, uh, which, which we started in 2011 and have been conducting since then. Um, we're now nearing completion, as I mentioned, of enrollment of this study at clinical sites that cover the U.S., Canada, as well as in Europe. Um, we are evaluating these patients out for 16 weeks beyond the therapy, and then we'll do a, a one-year uh, one follow-up. So we're excited about this. We, we expect to complete enrollment here imminently and have data sometime early next year. So I think that's going to be a very important event for us. A lot of the excitement around this program was based on a whole breadth of uh, work that we'd done earlier with a, a broad range of collaborative relationships that we've established. In fact, we work with dozens of investigators from over 30 different institutions across the United States and in Europe. And some of this work has, has uh, really provided a very deep understanding of how multi-stem can affect immune system function and restore durable immunological homeostasis or balance, if you will. And some of that is just visually depicted here, which shows you that in animals that have a very active disease process, 
in uh, adoptive transfer models of, um, of T-cell mediated pathology that if we treat with human multistem in an immunologically competent animal, that we actually see a complete reversal of that disease effect, which is manifest in the lower right-hand corner here in the GI tract, which is very important because it has direct relevance to treating things like inflammatory bowel disease. So again, I'm not going to walk through all the details of this, but it's, uh, it's something that we and our colleagues at Pfizer um, have found very exciting. We've also done work in some other um, clinical areas that relate to dysfunctional immune system, uh, if you will, um, including the work that we've done in preventing or treating prophylactically patients that are at very high risk for graft-versus-host disease. So we announced last year that we completed a 36-patient study in patients that are being treated for leukemia or other types of hematological conditions that will typically undergo what we like to think of conventionally as a bone marrow transplant, but um, really it's a hematopoietic stem cell transplant or a peripheral blood stem cell transplant. And these patients, unfortunately, can be at very high risk for graft-versus-host disease, as shown here. Typically, these types of patients will see something in the neighborhood of 50 to 75 percent occurrence of acute graft-versus-host disease. So we did a study where we were looking at single and mul or uh, multiple dose administration of multistem. We saw a very clean safety profile, and we also saw clear evidence of uh, a dose proportional reduction of the incidence and severity of graft-versus-host disease in these patients. Um, and that uh, data is actually summarized here. So you can see in the single dose group, again, we saw a very, what appeared to be a very profound reduction. In fact, only one patient in the single, in the high single dose arm got uh, graft versus host disease, and this was very, very mild and transient GVHD. And we saw a similar dose proportional reduction in the patients that received a series of low to intermediate doses, and this data actually reflecting intermediate doses um, over time. So again, very excited about this. We also saw some, some improvement in other clinical parameters. First off, we didn't see any graft failures, which is encouraging because that means we're not doing anything to inhibit the engraftment process. We also saw very rapid and very significant levels of platelet reconstitution in these patients. And again, this is very important because typically you may see a very substantial percentage of patients that don't experience good platelet reconstitution. They, go have, they have to go back to the hospital over and over again to get platelet transfusions. Uh, that, that's a real problem. We also saw very good uh, evidence of improvements in uh, relapse-free survival comparing against the historical benchmark. So again, a very encouraging picture here. Um, another program that we're very excited about, so we're now in the process of actually moving that program into a phase two, three registration directed study. We've been going back and forth with the FDA over the past few months, and we feel we're in very good shape about moving that program into a registrational uh, directed study. We've also got an ongoing program in the ischemic stroke area. Again, for those of you that are familiar with what's going, what's going on in stroke, literally in the U.S., Europe, and Japan every year, there's over 2 million people that suffer from an ischemic stroke. That number worldwide is about 15 million individuals. Uh, the only real therapeutic intervention that you can offer these patients is TPA or a comparable thrombolytic, but they have to get to the hospital within several hours in order to receive that treatment. The stark reality of it is most patients don't make it to the hospital in time, so less than 10 percent of the patients that actually suffer an ischemic stroke can get treated with a thrombolytic. So there's a tremendous area of unmet need here. The statistics around stroke are staggering. If you're over the age of 65 and you suffer an ischemic stroke, the odds are worse than one in four that you're going to have to live the rest of your life under permanent institutional care. That's not real good. Uh, I actually saw this happen to my grandfather, so I've lived through this personally, and I can tell you just how devastating it is. So we have actually done a lot of work that shows that, and again, we published much of this work, which shows that when we administer multistem in these types of neurological injury situations, these cells have a profound effect on limiting the inflammatory damage, preserving and helping maintain tissue that is at risk in the, in the region of ischemic injury, and actually promoting healing and repair through a variety of different mechanisms. There have been a lot of failures in stroke, neuroprotectant drugs or other approaches that people have used, but these are typically single modality therapeutics that act through one specific mechanism. What we are doing is fundamentally different. It has the capacity to act through a range of different pathways in parallel. It can actually drive healing and repair through a range of different mechanisms. So we think that we actually could change the nature of stroke medicine. Um, this trial continues to progress. We're conducting it at leading stroke uh, clinical centers in the U.S. and in the U.K. We may even broaden it beyond that. Uh, we intend to complete enrollment um, next year as soon as possible and then actually announce data shortly after that. One of the key things about this study is we're treating patients one to two days after they've suffered a stroke. That allows us to actually create a more robust evaluation of the clinical effects of multistem, and it also allows us to intervene in a clinically practical time frame. So we think if we're successful in this area, it's going to be a breakthrough moment, not only just for us, but we think it's actually going to have a broader impact on the field of regenerative medicine because it will probably change the perception around what is possible with cell-based therapies. 
We've done a lot of other work in other neurological conditions. Again, I'm not going to talk about this today, but I would note that a lot of this work has received substantial grant funding awards from the NIH or other grant agencies because it reflects the quality, the, I believe, the high quality of the work and the strength of the data that we've generated over the past several years. So again, happy to talk to you any about that. And this covers actually acute and chronic neurological uh, indications. So just in closing, we're a public company. We've been public since 2007. We're well capitalized with a very strong institutional shareholder base. Uh, we are a very focused organization. We are operationally lean and financially very efficient. We have a broad-based network, international network of collaborative relationships. And we're very excited about the future of regenerative medicine, not only within Athersis, but also the broader prospects for the field as well. So with that, I'd like to close and thank you very much for your time.